So there is a biomechanics paper which I'm going to get into, but first to do a recap of the beef. The disagreement starts with action film star Michael J. White teaching the late Kimbo Slice some boxing fundamentals that he believes are being executed wrongly by, as he puts it, top boxers. Like, I've trained with a lot of people, like uh, a lot of top boxers and stuff. Right, right. And a lot of boxers are taught how to throw a flawed, they, they're taught how to throw a flawed punch. Right. To illustrate his point about telegraph punches, he sets up a catch the hand game where he parodies the punches of top boxers and introduces a new concept of a non-telegraph punch which will land apparently even if thrown at a slow speed. That's one, two. Okay, now here's the third one. Don't let me hit it, ready? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <the hell. laughs> Come on, man. Michael J. White uses a physics explanation to explain the effectiveness of his punch by explaining the basic concept that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. At this point, the argument seems to make sense. However, there is the obvious red flag of if his method of punching is that much more effective, then why isn't it being used exclusively by top boxers? After all, the concept that the shortest distance between two points is not something that is difficult to understand. Right. My, 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 my. I move right. in an equal plane right. like this. You don't detect me moving forward. As the YouTube video blew up on YouTube and gained popularity, it was eventually seen by troubled UFC star Mike Perry. Perry apparently took exception to White's video, apparently feeling he had disrespected both Kimbo and the world of professional boxing. As the beef escalated, he challenged Michael J. White to an exhibition match with the proceeds going to a charity in Australia. As the beef further escalated, he dropped the end bomb which it has to be said was a very embarrassing look. He clarified his statement by saying that as he is 2% African, his use of the end bomb was not racist, which has to be said was even more embarrassing. In an interview on the DJ Vlad YouTube channel, White would respond by laughing off Perry's challenge match and implying that Perry was in way over his head. He doesn't know what he's... I have an assistant <laughs> named Alan Joban. Alan beat the shit out of, out of Mike Perry. You could look at it. It's like... It is true that Alan Joban does hold a victory over Mike Perry in MMA. However, the deduction that White seemingly seems to make in that as Joban is his YouTube assistant and even his assistant beat Perry isn't completely airtight. For instance, you have to wonder, does White draw a larger YouTube audience than Joban? because of the notoriety he acquired as an actor rather than because he would be ranked above Juban in a combat sports hierarchy. This issue, I believe, remains an open question. Back to the interview, White would apologize for his use of profanity. There's a part of me that's like, I, I hate hearing myself sound like that because it's beneath me. Since I've been fighting professionals since I was 17. If he, let me, let me I can just, tell him what I'm gonna hit him with, he, he can't stop it. Okay, and let me just say, it is true that Michael J. White has black belts in eight different martial arts. He has also trained and on some level sparred with many fighters in the UFC, such as Josh Barnett, John Jones, and Ben Saunders. He was also, I believe, successful in the world of karate point fighting, becoming at one stage the US Open champion. However, the idea that Perry would have nothing to offer White, even as a sparring partner, is an unsubstantiated idea with White seemingly mainly coming from a point fighting background and Perry having 11 wins via stoppage due to strikes in his MMA career, he might potentially have an edge in power striking over White. Even sparring with Mike Perry, that would be somebody who's like so, I don't think I've ever sparred or fought with anybody with that lack of skill. So unbeknownst to both guys, the whole time the beef was going on, a sports science team out of the University of Tehran in Iran had run a biomechanical analysis of a boxer's punch technique. To quote from the discussion section of the paper, they note that boxers flex joints partially, especially at the onset of the punch cycle, which is against their objective to perform the task in minimum time and with no additional movement. In other words, they share Michael J. White's observation that many boxers telegraph their punches by use of unnecessary movement 
and avoid the principle that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So if the field of biomechanics involved nothing but mechanics, then Michael J. White's criticism would hold up. However, the field of biomechanics involves both biology and mechanics, and it is the biology side of things that Michael J. White has seemingly failed to consider. The paper notes that the boxers use the universal biomechanical principle of the pre-stretch, subsequently followed by a stretch shortening cycle. There are many YouTube videos, blog articles and science papers which describe the principle of the stretch shortening cycle in more detail. I'm not going to go over it in detail here, but it can basically be thought of as a feature of muscle tendon unit elasticity. Use of the stretch shortening cycle is the foundation for all modern plyometric training. So looking here at a 3D model of a boxer's typical straight right punch, you can see that it's not a perfectly straight line. Right. My, 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 I move right. in an equal plane right. like this. You don't detect me moving forward. One thing the paper notes is that professional boxers punch with more elbow flexion than amateur boxers, as this allows them to punch harder. It would fit in with Michael J. White's point fighting background that he would favour a less telegraphed, yet also less powerful punch. So in conclusion, if you believe the science as I do, White's statement that top boxers are taught to throw a flawed punch. Like, I've trained with a lot of people, like uh, a lot of top boxers and stuff. Right, right. And a lot of boxers are taught how to throw a flawed, they, they're taught how to throw a flawed punch. Right. It's a half truth. The first issue with it is that it's very unlikely that boxers are being taught to throw a punch with elbow flexion, but rather they subconsciously adjust to increase elbow flexion when looking to power punch. Beyond that is a trade-off. A perfectly straight, non-telegraph punch will have a higher chance of landing but less of doing damage. So for some practical implications, if you are competing in point fighting, then you might want to focus on avoiding elbow flare and keeping your punches very tight. If you are more concerned about power, then sweating the elbow angle and trajectory of the punch may yield less benefits than working on aspects such as punching with the whole body.